Welcome to episode number 292 of Destination Linux, a video podcast show from the Tux Digital Network. If you're new to the show, Destination Linux is a discussion podcast perfect for every experience level. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the show for you. My name is Ryan. I'm Michael. And I'm Jill. On this week's episode of Destination Linux, we're going to be discussing, so you want to be a developer. You think you want to be a developer. It's like who wants to be a millionaire, but with code and stuff. Yeah. We're going to look at what 80,000 developers had to say about their favorite IDEs, best languages to learn, all of that. One of the biggest pools of developers I've seen. The study is fascinating. We're going to dig into it on this show. Then we'll be discussing issues with Signal and our adventures with Element and Matrix and potentially some good alternatives to consider. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All of this coming up right now on Destination Linux. This week's feedback comes from Gerald. If you want to send in your own feedback, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash contact to get in touch with us or join the Tux Digital community forum by going to tuxdigital.com and clicking on the forum link at the top of the page. Gerald writes, I respect the hard work you do. I really appreciate the advocacy and I've had my horizons broadened and I watch all the new casts on all the platforms. Woohoo! That's like awesome. That. <laughs> and if you want to be a true fan, you can watch all the platforms. Like, for example, we are on Spotify, YouTube. We have video version on YouTube, RSS feed podcast apps. We're also on basically everything, like Pocket Cast, Podchaser. We're on Pandora. We're on TuneIn. We're on iHeartRadio. Basically, if you can imagine it, we're on it. So Linux is everywhere, and we're everywhere. And, we're, with and this yeah. show is everywhere, too. <laughs> Yeah. So you want to be a true fan, subscribe on all those platforms. <laughs> and get your Linux is everywhere t-shirt. Exactly. They go on yes. to say, if possible, please mention this. It is really a follow-up to the VS Code and AKA Chrome and no choice topic that was discussed a while ago. And that was a few shows back. And then they were supposed to put a link there, but there was no link. So instead of not reading this important email, I took it upon myself to find out what they could possibly be talking about here because they go on to talk about the fact that this announcement was made just after that show was done and we were going on holiday, which I assume means when we went to scale because we didn't have an episode that week. And I just want to point out that we didn't, there was not a holiday. We were working at scale. We're working. <laughs> working. We were semi -work. working. I mean, we got to <laughs> hang out and have a lot of fun too, but. <laughs> I guess you could have fun while you work. So a couple of yeah. things that this could potentially be referring to with this is maybe the fact that they added an addition of Markdown to VS Code was one mm. possibility. Now, Markdown has always been extension, as I understand it, in VS Code, but now they've built that into VS Code directly. This is really interesting because I've been playing a lot with Jupyter Notebook. And one of the things that makes Jupyter Notebook really interesting is the different kernels and things that you can add into it for different languages. But a lot of people utilize it for Python and NumPy and those type of things. But it's inclusion of being able to utilize Markdown and, of course, writing and executing your code within that same notebook. And the Markdown kind of acts as a guide for storytelling if you're doing data with Python and or instruction sets like you would usually comment into a code you can do with Jupyter Notebook there as well. So it is very interesting to see that VS Code is taking that addition and kind of adding that in. So that could be what he's referring to there. Or there's a new release that includes a new Python easy start for beginners in VS Code as well that was announced. So it could be talking about that. And of course, during this episode, we were talking about the dangers of the fact that VS Code is so dominant. And we get later in the show, you're gonna see just what we mean when we talk about how dominant it is as well with the development community, not just personal use. But this easy start with Python really is interesting because there is nothing more annoying than getting started in Python. Like Python is an easy code to learn. It's a fun code to learn, but the biggest frustration is the initial setup, getting that initial setup working correctly. For instance, especially if you're a Windows user, which is why most people who code in Python tend to go towards Linux is you will install Python, but it's not gonna be included in your paths. 
And so you might have two different versions of Python. You'll use pip, but it won't install in the right environment. So you need to kind of create these virtual environments, which you can do in Linux too, but it's just much easier to get started in Linux. It's very annoying with other IDEs. In fact, when I was first learning Python, I was picking the IDE I wanted to use based on how can I get the engine to actually work? Cause I didn't understand all of the virtual environments and things as well as I should as a beginner, like most people. So the fact that VS Code is spending a lot of time making it super simple to start out in Python, I think is very, very interesting. It's a smart move on their part and something that's very oh, yeah. needed because Python's a nightmare to set up uh, with extensions and things and other IDEs. Uh, but part of me actually thinks that this could be an older announcement that VS Code is actually available directly through the Chrome browser now. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to install an app, now this is something that's not brand new. It's actually been out for a minute, but I wasn't aware of it until I saw this news item looking for what this individual's link might be, which by the way, Gerald, you need to send us what the actual link was and see if any of my guesses were correct here. Yeah. But because you mentioned Chrome and you mentioned VS Code in that sentence, I think it could be referring to the fact that it's going to leave the competition in the dust because basically with any machine that has access to a browser, you now have an IDE that you can run right through the browser. Think about Chromebooks and other things that may not be as powerful or capable of installing, not have as much space, frankly, to install a full program. Uh, you've got something like this, which allows you to code right from the web, which is pretty powerful. And that's yeah. VS Code.dev. If you have like a, like an ARM laptop that you can't install certain applications, you could get the browser version and just load it that way. That's a really yeah. interesting uh, solution for VS Code. I didn't know about this web app version of VS Code anyway, but until this topic. So I think that's really cool that that exists. Yeah, I, I, I respect the fact that you were deciding to predict what yes. the I went on an email is about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't know awesome. what it's about, but let's 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 try to figure it out. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. And and thank you so much, Gerald, for being such an awesome viewer and all your kind words. And I'm so happy that we have contributed to your Linux journey. Yeah, that makes us yeah makes us so happy and proud. And you know, uh, speaking on this topic, I actually know devs that use Windows for Python, but they use Windows subsystem for Linux and Windows to set up and use Python easily because it is so hard to set up on Windows. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so VS Code working on that is kind of fascinating when you think about the bigger picture of them trying to keep people, obviously, in the Windows ecosystem there. Um, yeah. I like that Gerald... Mm -hmm. Signs off saying, cheers and thank you so much for the care you put in. I'm in Korea and I'm letting you people know, I'm letting everyone know here what you folks are doing. So really appreciate Aww. that thank support so and spreading all the love there in love. Korea. And so <laughs> yes, send us a link back. Let us know what that link was that was missing and see if we uncovered the mystery. It's like a Scooby-Doo investigation <laughs> yeah, there. Exactly. <laughs> ruh <-roh. laughs> ah, ruh 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 right? Scooby-Dooby-Doo, looking for you. And if you want to get some awesome Scooby snacks of your own, you can go to DigitalOcean, because this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash tux2022 to get started. Cloud computing can be, let's say, complex, but standing up reliable, affordable cloud infrastructure really doesn't have to be. Thanks to DigitalOcean, you can get started and running on their awesome cloud platform quickly and easily. At DigitalOcean, you can enjoy a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. And speaking of teams, you can get started regardless of the size of your team. We have a team of one person or a team of a thousand people. DigitalOcean can help you get growing with their simple, powerful cloud computing. Plus, DigitalOcean has predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love. For example, the Marketplace is fantastic on DigitalOcean because it makes it possible to easily set up all sorts of different types of software with just a few clicks. One of my favorite things about DigitalOcean, and there's so much more, so go check it out at do.co slash tux2022. And did I mention you can get started for free, but it's actually better than free because if you go to do.co slash tux2022 or tux2022, you're going to get a 60-day $100 free credit when you go there. So go right now like right now and sign up at do.co slash tux2022 to get that $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's awesome cloud platform. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. So you want to be a developer. You want to be a millionaire, a millionaire developer. 
we're going to go into some studies that show you what 80,000 developers experience is like, what they say should be the IDE that you use, what they have as far as education and just their general preferences. So if this truly is a dream of yours, and we know we have a lot of developers that we get to interview on this show, we have a lot of people in the audience that tell us it's their dream to be a developer. This would be a good guide. And I would call it a guide just because some of this stuff applies to 80,000 people doesn't mean it necessarily has to apply to you. But I think it's really interesting because it's one of the biggest studies that I've ever seen as far as understanding what the development community is using day in and day out. And there's some amazing Linux news here, too, that we're going to get into. Before we get started, though, we need to make sure we, we got to set the rules for who wants to be a developer. Uh, can I phone a friend? Yes, but yeah. it has to be Jill or me. Well, that's that's very that's, limiting. Okay, yeah. okay, <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'll, I'll I'll keep that in mind. All right. So the first question that I caught my interest in this is: Where do you think most devs learned to code? So this is very interesting because your options are school, books, online courses, or certs. Which ones of those do you think? most people learn to code with out of the 80, 70 to 80,000? Because we took two years here and compared the two of 2021, 2022 of this survey. This is interesting. I think I, it has to be online, right? It has to be some sort of online and more than likely YouTube because that's how everyone learns everything now. It's YouTube. That's how I learned <laughs> to repair just, my refrigerator, yeah. <laughs> my washing machine. So why not learn to code there? Uh, interesting, 60% of respondents learn how to code from online resources, Michael. So you did good, you got that answer correct. Yes. You're still not gonna win a million dollars though. Younger yeah. respondents tend to learn from online courses, forums, and other online resources, while older respondents tend to learn from more traditional mediums like school and books. So it's interesting to think about the generation of kids that have grown up with the internet, where they learn to get information versus those who still have that access, but tend to learn better utilizing the more traditional mediums of how they would have learned when they were younger. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I actually found age very interesting because honestly, I think people really need to focus more on how they learn. You know, as an animation professor, I focus on what method is the easiest way for a student to learn. Some students just learn better by going through tutorials in a textbook. Some learn better by watching YouTube videos and, and other online videos. And some learn better by watching me go through my process as I demonstrate how to do something. And, you know, for this reason, I actually utilize as many diverse ways of learning in my classroom as possible. Those three ways are verbal, visual, and kinesthetic. Kinesthetic is, is a hands-on approach. But in reality, everyone learns with a combination of all three. <laughs> So oh, yeah. you, you, you want to be, you know, want to be, be diversified. And you might want to think about that when you're learning to code. There's many different techniques you can use. And what, what's interesting is in the survey, under 18 years of age, unsurprisingly, 84% learned from videos, blogs, and forums. Yes, it's the internet age. Yeah, <laughs> that makes, that, that that makes, makes sense. sense. I also yeah. think it's uh, like the best tactic that you're talking about is to try it all and just find what works best. But, you yeah. know, like for me, I started during, you know, when I started doing coding of any sort, it was during a time where videos weren't an option because YouTube didn't exist at the time. Yes, and absolutely. <laughs> now I find myself preferring videos these days, although finding the right video on any topic is pretty difficult at this point. But because there's so, so many options <laughs> and, and there's tons of just worthlessness because you'll get these like, random videos that it says how to get started in this and it's just like some like computer generated voice going through some yeah. weird random oh, article. Oh yeah, yeah, like, those the, robot voice Those videos. are super irritating, but yeah. uh, the videos <laughs> is now I feel like I kind of prefer that method that correlates to what you were saying, Jill. I think that's a really yeah. interesting and great point that people need to try the different variations to figure out what's, you know, their best way to do it. Yeah. For me, I tend to try to look at taking all of those methods when I want to learn something and enveloping cool. myself in all of them. And so I, when people ask me what's my preferred training method, I actually don't have one. I will, if I want to learn, like when I wanted to learn Python, for instance, I went and signed up for courses. I bought books. I got some podcasts that talked about coding and I watched YouTube videos. 
And so I take all of them and then I also code while I'm going through the videos or course material or books and do all that together. Because yeah. I find that's how I get things stuck permanently in my brain is to hit it from all sides at once and completely envelop myself yeah. in it. If I sense. don't envelop myself in it, what I tend to do is just learn the very foundations and never really truly understand the bigger picture in things. So if I stick with one method like a single online course mm -hmm. and I get those basics, that's where my knowledge would stop if I didn't just keep diving into different methods. So I grew up in an interesting time because I'm in between the age of, I didn't really grow up with the internet, but it came really early on in my childhood enough yeah. that I, I was learning it, but it obviously wasn't what it is today. And so most of my learning growing up was books and things along those lines, but online quickly became a big escape, not necessarily for learning and things, but chat rooms and all of that type of stuff. And then now it's of course such a big part of all of our lives, but I think taking all the forms of training and combining them is an interesting tactic. And clearly you do that in your classrooms, Jill, which is awesome. Yeah. So the next one is how young is too young to start learning to code? So we have a lot of people in our community who have children. And of course, the people in our community are brilliant savants because they use Linux. So they probably want to really get their kids into coding very early on. But how young is too young here? Well, 53% of developers wrote their first line of code at the age of 11 to 17 years old. So parents need to keep that age range in mind. And of course, 14% were between the ages of five and 10 years of age. And I expect kids will be continuing to learn younger and younger and younger as this goes on. Well, I guess there's a certain point where you can't go any. Too younger. young, seven months. Just born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of hard to code. Uh, but this has become a part of my kids' school. In elementary school, they started teaching them coding, basics yeah. of coding, usually drag and drop style coding where they Very just cool. make something move Scratch and things. And, yes, yeah. exactly. What about you, Jill? When did you start learning to code? So I started when I was six with my Apple II, with Apple Basic. That's, yeah. <laughs> that was the, the first computer in the home in the 70s. <laughs> so, and then I went to Pascal and Fortran on uh, VAX, uh, the VAX systems, uh, VMS OS, and then to Commodore Basic and Assembly, IBM Basic, and then Bash later on, of course. <laughs> Naturally. Yeah. <laughs> I still my, mostly use Bash now. <laughs> so, nice. yeah. Michael, you said you started at seven months of age. So how did that work? I said that's the too young. That was answering oh, that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I started around uh, 10 or 11. I'm not sure okay. exactly. So it's roughly around the time they were saying that it's very common for the, for the developers to do that. And I started around that um, doing web stuff and things like that. And didn't I didn't really keep coding. But then I learned stuff later on in different things. So when I started coding, I then took a break a couple of years and then went back when I was a you know, mid-teenager and then learned some other s languages and then dabbled in later in life as well. So it's kind of depending on the type of mood I'm in or, or whatever. That depends on how old I was to, to start doing certain types of languages. So um, I, you know, I learned web stuff like the first thing. And this was before the web got really complicated. Is this GeoCities? Does GeoCities count? GeoCities here? was involved. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Geo and Angel Fire also and involved. Prodigy. Oh, Angel Fire, <laughs> yep. man. Yeah. Also involved. Yeah. Lots, lots of those. I actually found a trick back in the day to get rid of the GeoCities pop-up block, so you wouldn't even, you couldn't even tell it was GeoCities. It was, it was fancy. So. <laughs> It was Everyone not fancy. Loved your Geo City site. There. Yeah, it, was it, was just, not, it was unbelievable. It was anyway, it was so good. So, uh, side note: If you ever seen the uh, Wreck It Ralph, there's the sequel of Wreck It Ralph called Ralph Breaks the Internet, and they oh, go yes. into like this uh, realm of the the discarded internet, and it's like a, a dump or something. And you can see yeah. a sign that says Geo Cities. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> I love that film. It's but, one of my favorites. <laughs> but, <laughs> it kind of brought me back with Angel Fire because I haven't yeah, thought yeah. about Angel Fire in a long time. That was interesting. Yeah, Angel Fire was was uh it was the, the competitors. GeoCities Angel Fire was like the big you know who's yeah. gonna win. Neither. So, but the uh, it was really uh, really fun to get started in it when I was when I, in that era because now it's so much more complicated. Back then there was like three or four languages to learn, and now in the web you have like fourteen options. And that, but there's still 
uh, it's still fun in general for me. I like, you know, experiencing different programming languages. So I still, you know, dabble in around. I wouldn't consider myself a programmer, but I do, you know, play around with different types of languages, you know, scripting languages or programming languages. There are uh, lots of things you can do. And the first time I was able to start building something, it was like, oh, I, I, I can actually do this. Like that was a fun revelation to just kind of start doing that. Awesome. So I think that regardless of how eight, how old someone is, like there is, mm-hmm. you know, if there's, if they're, you know, five or six, like you were talking about how they're, you know, being taught in school now, that is awesome. Because I think that yeah. that's going to make it more likely that people, that more and more people are going to be interested in doing that sort of stuff because they're getting exposed to it so early. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And Wendy talks about doing a lot with the robotics in her kids and STEM training and those types of things. What's neat about the robotics is a lot of those robotics, especially if you buy the ones made for kids, actually have the drag and drop programming too. So you're you're getting them kind of the concepts of movements or following paths and everything else without you're seeing the code as you're dragging and dropping it, but it's not as intimidating as sitting there writing a bunch of boring lines uh, initially for a kid, which would lose their attention really quick. Um, but what about being too old? You know, a lot of people think they might be too old to start learning all of these complex mm-hmm. programming concepts. So if you think you're behind because you haven't been coding for the last 20 years, you're in luck. Turns out that 70 out of the 70,000 developers, 29.91% of them have only been coding for five to nine years. So of the people who are professionally employed, who took this survey, 70,000 of them, they've only been coding for five to nine years. So you're not that far behind if you just start now and they're at their level being paid to do this in only five years. And 17.8% only had one to four years experience in actually coding. But when you talk about age ranges Hmm. here, yes, 48.42% are between the ages of 25 and 34, but 21% are 35 to 44 and 7% are 45 to 54. And we have a lot of silver surfers. Is that the right term, yep, Jill? Correct. That, that yes. watch and listen to our show. So <laughs> if you're a silver surfer and you're 65 <laughs> years or older, 0.35% still are learning to code for the first time, not too old to start and became professionals learning to code here. So 65 years or older, not too old. And what I love about this is, You ever hear the stories of somebody who's like in their 60s or 70s going back to college to get their degree? They don't need to get their degree. It's just something that was on their bucket list that they wanted to finish out in their life. And I feel like coding, that those type of stories inspire me a lot when I see that type of thing. Because again, there's no reason to do it other than they just want to get it accomplished and have something they could check off. And so when I think about 60, 70 year old or higher learning to code, I think it's amazing. And hopefully when you see these stats, if you're one of those individuals that have just thought coding's way beyond you or take too long to become a master of, you can see here, most people were between that four and nine year mark with their coding experience. So not that long to become a professional yeah. developer. I also think it's really interesting because like these days it might be even easier to become a developer because of yeah. the access to everything is so much more, mm-hmm. you know, like so it's at true. your fingertips. You can just easily start regardless of the style that you're, you know, used to learning. You can pretty much get all of those different things going through like online courses or, you know, video courses and stuff like that and get into the process of doing it regardless of the age because, it's going to take a lot less time. I remember when I started doing coding, I thought it was like this big giant thing because I have to get all these huge books to start learning different languages. Yeah. I remember getting the JavaScript Bible and it was like that thick. You can't really see <laughs> yeah. it in the audio version, but imagine like probably six, seven inches thick. It was huge. And it felt like I was just, you know, jumping into this mountain. And now because things are so easily accessible, it would arguably be a lot easier in terms of how long it will take just because you have, you know, so much, you know, more options in terms of how you can learn now. So I think that that is that 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 age range is going to go up, uh, you know, even the percentages of the different different age range is going to go up because of how much flexibility you have these days. Yeah. And I've had actually had uh, several students above 80 years old in my classroom Love and one it. that graduated with a degree in animation at 95 years old. That's and awesome. In, How cool keep, is that? Yeah. That's awesome. So wow. keep in mind my advanced students, including the 95 year old, um, uh, he had already been coding way back in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, he, he knew that, that background of it. But, uh, 
in my advanced animation courses, the students have to learn how to script and do code to do their animations. So that's part of my classroom. And um, I just, I love the diversity of age of students in my classroom because the younger ones learn so much from the wisdom and experience of the older students and vice versa. And the older students learn new techniques they have never thought of before from the younger ones. So it yeah. just makes such a rich and great learning environment. 95 really is the new 20. That's the Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah. Three yeah. seconds ago. I heard that. <laughs> you heard that three seconds ago. So I think it's awesome. This is, whether you're young or old, I think this is inspirational for both to say, get your kids started early on. Or if you are a kid watching this, get started in coding mm -hmm. early on. And then if you're older and have thought, oh, it's just past my time, you're clearly wrong because you're probably not 95. And if you are, you might have been Jill, uh, one of her students. There, yeah. In there. But there's never too late <laughs> to learn, basically. Well, listen, this has all been too kind and happy. So a subject that I'm going to drop in now tends to get really controversial with people, especially okay. I find programmers and hardware people and things that tend to like to learn things without having an official college degree. So mm. will a degree make a difference in you being a developer? Do you need a degree to become a developer? I have a answer for this, and that is uh, phone a friend. So Ryan, friend? answer this for me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So the statistics of 70 to 80,000 developers, this is not saying this to me doesn't necessarily at this juncture answer, do you need a degree? This is just what is the education of the 70 to 80,000 developers that were interviewed here? Primary elementary school, 2.46% had just primary elementary school education. Secondary school, which is high school basically, is 10.79%. So 10 of percent, 10.79 percent of them had a high school diploma. Some college was 12.73. An associate's degree was 3.05. Whereas a bachelor's degree took in 41.32%. It's a lot of people coming in with the bachelor's degree and a master's degree at 21.14. And after a master's degree, it drops off drastically back to the one, the 2% for anything past that. Now, we often hear people say that you don't need a college degree. Um, I could tell you college degree is definitely going to make your life easier in getting a job, namely because it's one of the legally only legally acceptable ways to minimize the amount of applications that come in for a job. And I know this personally because that's what I deal with, with a giant corporation. And so it's very, you may put a job out there and get 50,000 people apply for an open position. And legally, the only way I can minimize that as much as possible to get that down to a number I can actually potentially look through those resumes is to say, okay, let me throw out anybody without a bachelor's degree. And if there's still too many, I'll throw out anybody without a master's degree. And then I could just keep lowering it down mm -hmm. till I have a number of applicants that I can actually interview. And so that's how a lot of companies do it. Not every company. So I've been in both sides. I was initially a high school dropout that went back and got my college degree. In my time before being a high school dropout and not having a college degree, I had to work three to four times harder than my peers who had a degree. It was so much easier for them to go in and get a promotion than me. I had to just absolutely bust my butt and work insane hours to show that I had the skill set deserved to move up. Once I got a degree, things became a lot easier in that realm. And so I'm not saying you have to have a degree. I was very successful before I had a degree, but it came much easier after I got one. So the answer is, well, the answer is really, can anybody even afford a degree anymore? So maybe you don't need it. I mean, yeah, it that's, is a that's real important. problem. Mm -hmm. So if you can even afford one, if you're in the United States, that would be one of your first considerations. But you can see here, I think, a nice spread of that. You can see there's a lot of people who mm -hmm. only have a high school degree in things. In fact, one of the top coders on my team does not have a college degree at all. They're just high school taught themselves and they're absolutely insane. They blow everybody else out of the water. So it's not impossible but you're gonna have to work a lot harder, I feel like, when you don't have one. That's my personal experience and take. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting, especially with like, you know, basically a still a significant amount of people, if you combine all the other ones that are not about having degrees, that is still, you know, almost 30%, you know, that don't have a degree at all. 
that still are able to be in that field. And I think that is a significant thing to, to mention. And Joe, I want your take on this because obviously you're in a college, you teach these classes, you've dealt with yeah. lots of students that have been successful and things on there. Uh, before we do though, I just want to mention certificates is a really interesting thing. You can get those through a college and or through other courses online and get certificates that prove that you have the skill set and knowledge. And while not maybe as accepted as a bachelor's degree or easy to get an interview per se, they're definitely something that I look at when I see somebody's resume and impress me, especially when I see that there's a consistent uh, use of trying to get more and more education, meaning there's a consistent gain of different certifications and things that that person's pursuing and not just one cert or one cert 20 years ago, but something they're continually pursuing and a lot cheaper as well. So certs is another option. But Joe, what is your take on this? Yeah, so I recommend people to at least go to a community college where the prices are a lot less uh, yeah. to, to start your classes. And then from the community college, then transfer to a, a four-year university and get your, your BA degree. It's, it's a lot cheaper <laughs> to do that route. That's, that's how I did it. And then, and then, you know, I was able to apply and I got grants and everything. I worked my, my bottom off to get grants and keep my grades really high and everything. So that, that is one way. And there is a thing called financial aid. And what a lot of people don't realize is the, the schools actually get more money for financial aid students. So they want financial aid students. They, they want to give you those grants, you know, er, every year. So oh, that's it's, it's worth it that. to look into that, <laughs> definitely, because so many of my students don't realize that. And a lot of the big four-year universities, like here in L.A., we have USC and UCLA, you can get grants um, so you don't always have to get loans that you have to pay off for years and years. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's really important. Call it, uh, local community colleges are, are a good option as yeah. well for people. And again, we're not saying you have to. Uh, Neil mentioned something. Many companies believe that a college degree indicates a level of competence in learning. Mm -hmm. um, and Jill, you had mentioned that in our pre-show, you know, that there are yeah. definitely companies that look at it as, hey, this is somebody who applied themselves to something. They spent True. two or four yeah. years pursuing it and we're able to accomplish it. And that shows some level of motivation and things as well for a person. Yeah. And it, it really, it's also depending on the field. Like in, in my world of animation, all the um, animation studios in Hollywood, they require a, a BA degree. And, and in, like you were saying earlier, Ryan, I'm sure it's a lot to weed out, you know, the applicants and they're asking for, for the kids to have uh, master's degrees now. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm sure that's part of it. That's the world that I live in. And um, sure. I think, you know, if you have built a network as well, it can be, you can move past those things, but it's going to be a more difficult journey for you. Yeah, it is. Oh, oh, another one are code camps. Those are starting yes. to pop up everywhere. And we have like here in LA and in the big cities, there are sometimes free code camps that you can take and get certifications. And those yep. are great. Nice. Yeah. So what's the most popular programming language? This one you see Cobalt. a lot, like a lot of, Michael, you're ruining the whole punchline of this whole thing. I'm pretty Cobalt, sure I'm not. of course, is number one. <laughs> no. Uh, but a lot of people, I see these searches constantly. What's the most popular programming language? I see it on Reddit and things, people going to developer forums. What language should I learn? What's the most popular one? What's the one I'm going to make the most money on? I know a lot of people want to know the answer to this question. So 70 to 80,000 <laughs> professional developers what are they primarily using as their language? Well, JavaScript took the very, very tippity top. That's not really Markdown, Michael. Not HTML. Yeah. Markdown is not a programming language. So technically, oh. that's a, it yeah. is its own little okay. category. But, right. but it's interesting because the JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and PHP separation, while it does make sense in terms of how the technology mm -hmm. works, they are different languages. However... When you're making a website, you're pretty much using all four of those. All those, things. yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it kind of skews it in that sense. So I understand why they split it up. But like, I would say that if you're using JavaScript, you're automatically using HTML and CSS because you kind of need those in order for the rest of it to work. Yep. So interesting, HTML, when you look at the growth from 2021 to 2022, JavaScript actually dropped down from 68 to 65%. And HTML, CSS pretty much stayed the same. It was a little bit of a drop, tenths of a point of a drop there. And then SQL 
went down tenths of a point in popularity. But you know what shot up and took all of that? What's that? Python. Mm, so Python was fourth on the list, but it went from 41% to 48% in popularity. That's awesome. Python is everywhere. Like It is. First of all, I love this language. I love learning this language. I hate setting it up. So VS Code's really smart in the, <laughs> making it easier to set up in IDEs. But I, I just absolutely adore this language because its syntax makes so much sense. And it's limitless in what you can do with it. There are so many applications for Python everywhere. So I love that it's growing there. Next was TypeScript, followed by Java, C Sharp, Bash Shell, PHP, and C++ was at the, there was more that were towards the bottom. Out of this list, C++ was at the bottom, but it went up from 19.94% in 2021 to 22.55%. So C++ showing uh, some growth there, whereas PHP shrunk, Bash Shell grew. Yeah, that's what I was excited about. How dope is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting because yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of these languages were dropping. Like, cause in, yeah. this, in the top list, most of them dropped to us, like maybe a couple to a couple percentages or whatever, but the bash went up and so did uh, C plus plus and Python and Python with the biggest jump, as you said, mm -hmm. and it makes sense because Python is one of the best ways to get started in programming. And when yeah. you want to do more than complex stuff, because you can get something that's very simple, but also can, like you said, you can do pretty much whatever you want, including web stuff if you wanted to. There are websites yeah. powered by Python, for example. Or data analytics, which I tell people all of the time who are looking for a new career, get into data analytics. The, the amount of money being thrown at data analytics, the amount of job growth in data analytics all makes sense. When you look at all of the biggest companies right now, what are they trying to figure out? What to do with all of this data they collected from you? <laughs> Right, All of this yeah. data that they've got, how are they going to take that and turn it into something useful? It is a real problem in nearly every big company or industry that you're looking at right now is all of the data, whether it's the data they're collecting from their users or the data in the speed of their manufacturing or just anything, all of these new tools and gadgets and technology, all of it represents more data that we have that we can use to make decisions in our business. And you need people to interpret that. So breaking down the database querying language outside mm -hmm. of just languages to learn, which by the way, Python is amazing because you can combine it with R and other things to do a lot of uh, analysis work and stuff. But MySQL shrunk yeah. from 50.18 to 46.85, which was interesting mm. to me. Postgres grew from 40% to 43%. And I see a lot of people talking about Postgres SQL lately. So that oh, makes yeah. sense. Uh, SQLite stayed the same. MongoDB grew by a percent. And Microsoft SQL Server stayed about exactly flat the same. And that's the one that I see uh, in a lot of big corporations is the SQL Server I stuff like the, there. Oddly enough, I do like to see that that is not growing because of the Postgres it, the platform is so interesting and one of the fastest database systems I have ever used. Yep. Like, I don't know how it's so fast compared to the rest of them, but I've used uh, MariaDB, I've used uh, yeah, MySQL, uh, SQLite, and all of these things are good for what they are. Like, when I started using like uh, MySQL in the beginning, because uh, that's, that's how I started in the web world, because that's what was the most commonly used at the time. And then now that I, when I played, when I st first started playing with Postgres, it blew me away with how much faster it is. Like that's just, yeah. mm -hmm. so it makes total sense that it's growing in terms of percentage use. Yep. I'm happy to see the MongoDB numbers going up because that that's one of the, the newer uh, database language, uh, you know, uh, variations of SQL. Yep. So that's really Great. good to see. <laughs> Some people will say these aren't programming languages, they're querying language, potato, potato, that type of thing. But one interesting thing when they asked the developers, okay, never mind which one's most popular, which one do you love the most? What do you think they came up with? It wasn't Microsoft SQL, it was Postgres SQL. Postgres, the, yeah. The most definitely. loved <laughs> uh, out there database. So that actually surpassed Redis, which for five years running was the most loved before. So now Postgres is definitely one that you may want to check out and really easy to set up and start learning on DigitalOcean, by the way. So this is this is a perfect application for DigitalOcean. I mean that. Like if you're learning one of these things, being able mm -hmm. to take a droplet in a marketplace, drop it or create your own real quick. And then when you're done with the class, you can just destroy it and create another droplet for the next portion of the class. 
-hmm. insanely important. That's how I learned MongoDB was yep. with a, a droplet. <laughs> nice. Well, it was awesome. I, I use it for a lot of the courses I'm in. Speaking of the cloud, yeah. like DigitalOcean, we hear so much about the clouds nowadays. Back in the day when I was young, we'd just stare up at the clouds and be like, look, that looks like Spider-Man. That looks like a rock. Now when we talk about clouds, we're talking about putting our computers, our networks into the <laughs> cloud. How do you like that? Nostalgia, nostalgia Ryan. I, yeah. I remember like, oh, right. Oh, there's Scooby-Doo right there. <laughs> there's Scooby-Doo. There's some Scooby snacks. Look, a cupcake out of the cloud. And a muffin, oh, too. A there's a muffin A, a there. droplet at Digital Ocean. That's their Ah, uh, there you go. So what if you're not vested in one technology or another? You want to learn one about this cloud stuff that everybody's talking about constantly? Well, AWS consistently maintains its lead as the most widely used cloud platform. But Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure made substantial gains from last year. So it kind of used to be like a slaughter fest. It was AWS and then a little bit of everybody else. But Google Cloud and Azure are really picking up speed here. Does this surprise any of you? No, no. No? The marketing behemoth of Microsoft and they own GitHub. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, a that GitHub natural move. Yeah, that GitHub purchase a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah, and they they have Microsoft has done so much in the open source world, so they've really have come of age. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of genius too because they have the most popular IDE that has an incorporation with GitHub, which would be your most popular code repository, yeah. and they make it <laughs> so simple to be able to take your code and move it and merge it and pull it and all of that right from Visual Studio Code. It's just, and now they're making Python and everything easier there. And by the way, you can also use Visual Studio Code to connect to your Microsoft SQL servers, look at your actual databases and tables there, run query languages right there from the same tool, never leaving that IDE. So when you look at Microsoft from a big picture standpoint, this family of tools they're creating, it's dangerously good. Mm -hmm. It's dangerously mm -hmm. good. So AWS has 51% of the market, Microsoft Azure 28%, Google Cloud 26%, Firebase 21, Roku 19.98, and DigitalOcean fighting back, coming with the 15.64%. What surprised me was VMware was only 8%, Oracle yeah, Cloud was only 1.8, and IBM yeah. Cloud or Watson at 1.68? Like I thought That's IBM would low, have yeah. a much bigger... I was, I, I, I'm that. surprised by that. I'm not surprised by Oracle because it's Oracle and people don't like so. Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> but be I nice, do think Michael. that but DigitalOcean is, should, should be much higher than that. So let's, uh, let's do that. So go to do.co slash tux2022 to get signed up for DigitalOcean. Yeah, let's see if we get that 17, 18% next year. Help us out. Because exactly. honestly, uh, I've used a lot of these platforms at work and for personal I just love DigitalOcean. I mean that like not even just them as the sponsor, but their oh, yeah. interface is so easy to get around with in comparison to these others who have like eight bajillion different options all over the place and different menus and things. And knowing what I'm spending is the most important part. It's also and that's where I don't trust these other platforms as much as I do DigitalOcean. Like I know yeah. what I'm going to spend on DigitalOcean or these other ones. It's like, well, this type of service is billed by the minute or the hour or this, and it could be this much, or you can set range limits mm -hmm. though, but sometimes those range limits don't apply to this other service you also set up because you forgot to set up a range limit there. So guess what? You got a $10,000 bill. You hear about those stories all the time. I'm not even exaggerating. You yeah. hear them in the news all the time because it's not as simple as you think. Never happens on DigitalOcean, really. Right, that's uh, that's one of the reasons we love DigitalOcean, but also it make clear we were already using DigitalOcean before they became a sponsor of the show. We yeah. we've been that's that's pretty much all of the, all the sponsors we ever have are basically that things that we want to talk about, and they're they they we are already using anyway, like Bitwarden and DigitalOcean. We are already you know fans of those platforms before they became sponsors, and like there and there's so many great reasons. I mean, we could talk for hours about why DigitalOcean is fantastic, but that whole predictable pricing thing is one of, one of the cool. best things. <laughs> I know exactly mm -hmm. what I'm going to pay. Uh, when it comes to tools used here, I think a lot of people are going to find this interesting because I don't know about you guys, but I like to know what real professional developers are using and use those tools because I figure they know more than me about why this tool is good. So I'm going to use whatever they're using here. 
Uh, that's just how I roll with this stuff. Yeah, so yeah, just follow the follow the leader. I, I get. Yeah, I'm gonna follow it. the leader. The people who know what they're talking about. So over 90 percent of respondents use Git, suggesting it's a fundamental tool to being a developer. Yeah. I saw articles like sense. this. I make Git a part of the mandatory training on my own teams uh, for utilizing it because it has become an absolute necessity. In fact, 93.43 percent of the 80,000 respondents said you need to know Git. You got to mm-hmm. know Git. Think about that. That. That's not even like a maybe I should learn it. It's you better learn Git basically at 93%. Yeah. Thank you to Linus Torvalds. Make sure to get it done. Ah, well done, Jill. Why are the nice. good dad jokes coming from Jill now? <laughs> you know? I, I, I think she's I think she's trying to take the reins from me. She's I'm, I'm going to battle back. I'm going to battle back. So. so another tool they said at 48.85% is Docker. 17.73% say you need to learn to play with yarn. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> and I've actually so, never heard of yarn. And I mean, I'm not in this huh? world necessarily, but like. I wonder uh, if this, those are cats. Everything else I've heard survey. of. Those yeah. are cats yeah. that took the survey in there. They're like, yarn. You learn yarn. Yarn is awesome. Love it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. K- Kubernetes at 16%. Unity 3D. Jill, I was surprised to see Unity that's make this list at 9.8%. Exciting. Yeah. And an- Ansible <laughs> at 7.6%. Um, yeah. Interesting. Ansible. I expect Ansible's amazing. Ansible to be, you know, they, they've only been around that grow. for a little while. So that that's going to grow for sure. And uh, the I, I just been dabbling recently with Ansible and it is so powerful. I am like mm-hmm. kind of blown away with how much you can do with it. So I suspect that's going to be in the next couple of years, that's going to, you know, be a much higher percentage of people. Yeah. So was GitHub a good purchase for Microsoft? You think, well, let's see how dominant <laughs> GitHub is here. Uh, GitHub, when we talk about version control platforms, owns 87% of the market, 87% of the market for all personal code use. But that drops dramatically on the pro side. And I have a feeling this has to do with Microsoft having bought GitHub because on the pro side, professionals using GitHub, that drops to 55.93%, which is by far still the greatest share, but not as high as for personal use. So personal use, people use it 87% as their primary version control system. Professionally, about 55%. GitLab at 20.5% for personal and only 28% in pro, or I should say that's a good thing, 28% in pro. And then Bitbucket at 18.42% for pros and only 10.48% in personal. Bitbucket, not as widely known, I guess, in the consumer market as it is for the professional right. developers there. But it's it's really interesting that the the pro is a lot higher on Bitbucket than it is on the professional or personal stuff. But yeah, I think it's and I'm going to do like a little bit of a twist. I think the numbers for GitHub are down since Microsoft bought it. Mm-hmm. That's what I was thinking too. I would put it; it would probably be in like the upper ninety percent because of before that. GitLab was still really good as a tool, but it wasn't that known. And then when the GitHub purchase from Microsoft happened, GitLab became massively more talked about and more promoted around the communities and stuff. So I think that this is still like, it's still a good purchase. As you can tell, the percentages are still pretty high. I think it might've been a little bit higher. So I want to go back and check the surveys and see if they're, if they have any information about that before Microsoft bought it. Yeah, that would be interesting because GitHub was huge, you know, before Microsoft took them over. They were the dominant, you know, player in the space. And yeah, that would be interesting, Michael, to see if it has gone down. Well, the primary repository for open source code itself is not open source. It's kind of odd, right? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that is interesting. Strikes me as unusual. All right. ID. (laughs) IDEs. This one we've talked about in a prior episode. We talked about, in fact, the email that we got earlier was talking about an episode where we discussed the dangers of one IDE platform dominating this entire arena of development. And Visual Studio Code from 2021 to 2022 went from 71%, which is obviously insane amount of the market already, to 74%. So it's not slowing down. It's getting bigger than it was before. And the second biggest is Visual Studio. So it's they, they kind of own the first and second place here. Uh, IntelliJ comes in third at 27.71 in 2022. They had actually lost some percentage, 29 to 27. And Notepad++, again, also lost from 29 to 27 in between 2021 and 2022. So they went down in percentage, but they're still fourth. 
Vim went Woo, from 24 Vim. to 23%. I can't believe Vim. I cannot believe Vim is in this top 10 list. Oh, yeah. I don't know. As high. I know I'm going to get hate mail for this, but I just, Vim is not. How are people? I mean, I know there's a lot of individuals who grew up with it and they love it. But really, like, if you tried any modern IDE and you still prefer Vim, <laughs> I just, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I, I understand. It's job security, because who else is going to be able to figure out HJKL moves your cursor around to edit your code? So if they fire you, nobody's going to have any ability to know how to uh, how edit to your, your code. Yeah, yeah, they're done. <laughs> but I think that they're, like, that's a very interesting point. I mean, the top 10, I'm surprised. It's also number five. That's even more surprising yeah. to me because, you know, I wouldn't, I would, I, I agree. Well, I would have expected it to be a lot lower than that. I expected it to be in the list, <laughs> but not that high in the list, I guess. But also, it's all the, of uh, us older coders from the Unix days. It could <laughs> be. learned by Jill. <laughs> do you so use many... Vim in a ID, as an IDE? Do you use I have, Vim? yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have, but that's different yeah. than do you still use yeah. it? Like, no, I, I understand I'm not using, using it, it when y'all yeah. had to use Vim <laughs> as. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but when now? there was an awesomeness like Sublime Text, for example. You yeah, know, like I get why awesome. people. Wouldn't. By the way, if you listen to the Adam. podcast version, my name's Michael. Send your email about my Vim comments to Michael. <laughs> that is at not okay. what happened. That, no, I'm Michael. We already we already said our names in the beginning of the show. Vim Ryan. people are savage, you know. Like you don't want to get on their bad side. I'm just surprised. I love you, Vim yeah. people. All right, Android Studio is next. Uh, they shrunk from 21 to 19.8. Sublime Text dropped big time, 19 to 16. It's you know what the problem time. with it's Sublime Text? It's like three percent. It's like three. I know you love Sublime Text, but you got you got you know, these are it's the best. It's the best. Based them. on the statistics, maybe not, but based on like reality, it is the best. Like I I use that. Uh, I I did a study of my own, and oh. I asked I, I asked thousands and thousands of Sublime Text users why they that what what is the best uh, application to use, and they all said Sublime. I mean, it's shocking that they would shocking. do that. Yeah. Uh, PyCharm went up, and I'm not surprised. PyCharm is brilliant nice. for Python. You see yeah. Python growing, you're going to see PyCharm growing 16 to 17%. Eclipse dropped down from 14 to 12. Xcode from 12 to 10. Atom is going to go to nothing because yeah. they've gotten rid of Atom, which I'm pretty sure we predicted on a very, very yes. long episode. Pretty a long much time as ago, soon as they purchased GitHub, we were saying, yes, Atom's going away. Yeah. yeah. So and Unfortunately, but we it's expected because... Microsoft will be competing with themselves, and why would they want to do that? So I totally get why that happened. But at the same time, if you look at all these numbers, it's super interesting that basically everything went down except, except for PyCharm and VS Code. That's it. Yeah. Those and, are your two big competitors right now, yeah. for sure. And if what, you look at Sublime Texas model, it makes no sense. They still want $99 for the IDE. Then they want another, like, I don't know, $50, $60 for their merge tool, oh, which yeah. most tools have that built in now. <laughs> like Visual Studio Code is free, and I don't even need to go take a second application to track my merges and stuff. They want to charge like $169. Like I want to support Sublime Text. So Sublime Text does not I, track everything you do. It doesn't have a ton of telemetry, so that's step one. Also, yes, step Codium. two is... <laughs> It is native programming. It's native uh, program. It is super fast to compare. It is, doesn't require electron nonsense. Sublime Text is the best. Also, it's the innovative thing. Most of the time, when you talk about Atom and VS Code, they just copied what Sublime Text did. A lot of the mm -hmm. different tools True. that people yeah. are like, oh, this I'm is so I'm not here benefit. arguing okay. <laughs> that Sublime Text is not great. I'm saying I just they help to... me support them by not making their price, which everything else is free, and I'm willing to pay for it, but don't charge me $160 or $149 for an IDE. How about well, you give me Sublime Merge and Sublime Text and I give you like a $60 bill or $50 bill plus a $10 bill. Something like a little more reasonable. I think it's reasonable. fair That's to say that saying. they shouldn't have a bunch of other things that are all separate. I think it would be cool if they had like a, a bundle where you could just get them all at once. And I do agree with that. And I do think the price going up it's is the outrageous. wrong direction because it was seventy five and now it's ninety nine. And like it should, you should go the other way because that makes more people want to do it. But at the same time, I do think Sublime Text is good enough to justify the cost, even at the higher price. It is even though you don't pay that cost. Let's be yes, honest. Yes, I do. You've, you yes. paid it one time and you've never done it again. And so no, you can no, you you basically pay it on a per major version. So if you pay yeah. like. Sublime Text. But you did that two. once and you no, never. I, every major yeah. version. 
Okay. But they, it takes them like two or three years for a major version, so it's not like you're not doing it all the time. I'm so. surprised Mr. Cheap himself actually bought that. I have a, pers- I have a principle. I kind of want proof. Yes, I am. Ser- in this version, I, I want proof that you actually had recently bought a new version of Sublime 3 when it came out. I mean, it's not new, but... It's not I, new. I just, yeah. I'm calling but, Muffin on this whole thing. I think thing. Sublime 4 is out uh. now. I haven't purchased Sublime 4 because I'm not using it yet, but I do want to... I will when it happens, okay? So okay. Right. the whole thing about Sublime Text is that it is... I think it's the best because of how much flexibility it have and how lightweight it is and low on resources and all that stuff. But it also is innovative. They've created a lot of cool different techniques and programming, and that's why I, I promote it and that stuff. But I also want to say, like on principle, I think that this is the this is a good uh, random tangent, I guess, that when you're using something that makes you money, like you're a programmer yes, and you're using, totally. it, you should definitely pay for the stuff. And I think that the amount that they're asking for. If you're professionally doing something like that, it's not a lot. Like that. Yeah, but that there that even on a personal use license is 149 bucks. That's my point. Anyways, the point is you can use Sublime it Text for free forever. It just has a little dumb thing that pops That's up true. that says, "Hey, do you want to buy this?" Every like three or four saves, it no, will pop up and ask no, you that. No, it's every 100 like saves. It is not that irritating. <laughs> It's every 100. Every three or four will be incredibly irritating, but it's every 100. That's okay. not so and bad. And it never goes away. It never expires. Like, you can just keep right. doing that it's forever. It's an a, a infinite evaluation period, which I do think that that's respectful of nice. the way of, of doing it. Like, you can still use it for free, but they don't, like, outright say that it's free, you know? I, I think that's reasonable. Right. Well, it shouldn't be... It should be about the price of a video game. All right, this next section... I think is it made me smile really hard. And I think all of our listeners are going to love this. What about the yes. OS the developers use? This was not, by the way, a study done for Linux and open source people. This is just 80,000 developers that they surveyed here. And when we look at the OS, Windows went from 45 to 48% yeah. as the most dominant OS. But Linux, <laughs> listen to this jump, mm-hmm. went from 25% to 40% yeah. of the nice. market. 40% nice. percent between 2021 and 2022. It went from 25 to 40 That is awesome. Percent of the OS that so developers exciting. were using. That, this is so exciting. That is insane, the popularity. <laughs> um, Mac OS, 25 to 31. And I think that makes sense, frankly. Yeah. It, it, as far as a coding platform, Mac OS, if there wasn't a Linux, would probably be what I would be on. But there is Linux, so don't have to worry about that. But it's also awesome a little that bit of the, you know it went, the Linux jumped up so much, and but also I just want to point out that from last year, Linux was already still higher than Mac, so that didn't change. So this is this is a, ju- a good jump for Mac, but it's a huge jump for Linux, and I am so excited about that. I mean. Windows grew a little bit, but that's expected because, you know, that's what happens when you're shipping on every device and automatically that it makes it a lot easier. Well, I think some of that Windows but, growth is going to come from WSL, frankly. A lot of people probably yeah, utilizing true. WSL within Windows because mm, we've we've made it so true. easy for Microsoft to do that. And if you're going to be a Python developer, I don't care if you don't care about <laughs> yeah, OSs, you're going to want to do it in Linux. You're not going to want to do it in Windows. It's so yeah. obnoxious. <laughs> Uh, synchronous tools and communication. What are the tools that developers use to talk to each other, to hang out, to talk about code, not the latest Lord of the Rings movie or anything else? Well, that would be Zoom. Zoom mm. is 56%. Microsoft Teams, 56%. Slack, 53% of them. Google Chat, 20 Cisco WebEx down at 9% there. Mattermost at 4 and Rocket Chat at 2%. I don't think any of that's very surprising. I mean, no. I may be surprised a little bit that Microsoft Teams wasn't higher on this, but Slack, I, I think... I Slack to win. It's going to be oh. huge. Yeah, I think Slack uh, will continue to grow here. Yeah, I mean, Zoom the fact became- that there's only a, there's a small <laughs> difference, there's like only a couple percentages difference between all the top three anyway, yeah. but I was expecting Slack to be at the top, so I was kind of surprised that Zoom was the top, but then once I saw it, like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, Zoom became the new hotness, especially during the pandemic, and it has a catchy name. <laughs> I think you're going to see next year, if we do this again, Slack will be up above uh, up higher. the others. Yeah, I think Slack has done an amazing job. And I think um, WebEx is going to continue to drop. Yeah, I agree with that one. 
Now, this was my favorite question as somebody who manages coders and things like that. <laughs> what do you do when you get stuck? They asked 80,000 developers, what do you do when you get stuck with a piece of code? And anybody who's ever touched code knows that feeling of getting stuck on something. In fact, that recently I was doing, I have a new script out on my GitHub. It's a new Python game, and it's very advanced for me, not for any other Python coder. But for me, it's my most advanced code. And one of the things I was trying to do, I spent like two days trying to figure out, could not figure it out. I was doing that thing where I told you where I take classes, books, and everything else. I was looking through a book, couldn't find the answer. One of the classes, somebody randomly mentioned it in like a comment, and it was the solution I needed. So you never know where you're going to find that answer to your code, but 89% Google it, 79% visit Stack Overflow for their answer, 48% do other work and come back later, 46% call a coworker, a friend, that's Michael, phone a friend. Phone a friend, yep. <laughs> 39% go for a walk or do some other physical activity, 39% watch helper tutorial videos, 12% play games, and my favorite one, 10% panic. Panic. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> panic. Freaking panic. Like that's, 10% of them are like, I just friggin' start panicking. 9% uh, meditate and 7% visit some other developer community there. So I, I don't That's know right. about you all, but I found this so interesting and fascinating to, cause it's so many developers, you know, between mm -hmm. 2021, you had 80,000 developers in 2022, there were 70,000 developers surveyed in this. And we could combine these two years to give you guys some of this information here together. A lot of fascinating information. And if you're a developer, send us comments. Let us know uh, what we got right, what we got wrong. You think in the survey stuff. Well, not us. We didn't do the survey. So we didn't yell them. Stack, Stack yeah, Overflow did the, did the survey. It is yeah. super interesting because Stack Overflow is listed as number two in the results of the Stack Overflow survey. And that might seem like it's skewed a little bit, but it's not because Stack Overflow is heavily used by people who didn't take this survey too. And it's it's really interesting because when it, I when I looked at this, like how do you how do you figure it out when you get stuck? And I usually search for it whether it's a Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing or something like that. I'm still searching for it. Lies. Often the first thing you do if this was your survey was go to Neil. No, oh. go to Neil. <laughs> the first <laughs> yes. thing you do, no matter what the problem is, if it's hardware, you go to me. If it's anything else, it's Neil. This is a fact. I mean, Neil is one it, of our patrons, by the that's way. That's a higher. Uh, that's a high percentage action, yes. But I would. Yes. I, 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 I would I don't, say seventy percent. I, I, I don't go without first searching to see if I can find the answer for myself at a principle of not spending <laughs> other people's times, unless it's about hardware. Then I do go to Ryan immediately and just ask him what what to do. Or <laughs> that has that's happened before. But I do like to search first. What I was saying, and before Ryan uh, gave my secret out, so. Uh, I go search on various search engines and to see what the uh, what I could find for the answer. But oftentimes, I think probably at least sixty percent of the time, the answer I get is from Stack Overflow. Like it's yeah. just so dominantly used, and yeah, yeah, it's it's there's so much great stuff there, and uh, there's also like different subs like uh, websites. So Stack Exchange is like this big suite of different websites. And then there are other websites that are using the same technology, such as Stack Overflow and other ones like that. And there's a wide variety of them. And I have, on occasion, found answers to things that I was stuck on on these websites where the person who provided the answer was me two years prior. <laughs> and that's fun. Oh, that is funny. <laughs> the past like you was smarter than the future you. Exactly. I, I actually was looking at this and I'm like, I remember... What is the the solution? I remember fixing this before. Like, oh, how did yeah. I how did I find the answer? And then I went to the thing. Like, <laughs> oh, I, that's how they, I found the answer. Okay, me got it. It might have happened multiple times. I I can't I can't confirm. Well, you know what everybody agrees on in the development community that you need a good password manager. Agreed. And that's yes. why this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com/tux. That's slash T-U-X. You want to make sure you type that in because you want them to know we sent you there. A password manager software allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. So when you go and you sign up for that Stack Overflow account so that you can ask questions or give answers to questions, you need somewhere to have a safe username and password. And guess what? Bitwarden can auto-generate you a username so you can have different usernames for every site and auto-generate your password 
and keep those safe and secure and automatically put them in for you so you don't have to sit there and try to remember that super long secure password that you made because Bitwarden is an amazing secure vault for all of your passwords across all of your sites. Bitwarden provides you the tools and it automatically encrypts all of these passwords on your device locally. So you know that this information is never going out there online to be stolen by others. Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption to do this, and you can use it across a plethora of all your devices from your web browser, mobile apps, desktop applications, even the terminal if you want to there. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started, and you can do that for free, absolutely free. But if you want to support this amazing project that supports so many other amazing open source projects, go to bitwarden.com slash tux and sign up for their $10 a year account, which gives you a gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, and Priority Customer Support. You get all of this for less than a dollar per month. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started. In the news, we're going to be talking about some communication platforms and also some really interesting stuff that's happened to us that we're going to get to in a bit. So Signal is a privacy-focusing messaging app that people rely on for you know keeping stuff private. And in the news, there's some unfortunate stuff that has happened recently, and that is that it appears around 2,000 users of Signal have been notified that they have been a part of a phishing attack that took place on a different platform. So the news is that Twilio was a part of a recent uh, phishing attack that some of their employees' uh, login data was uh, acquired, and they took uh, about 2,000 people, 2, people related to Signal. Now, we don't know exactly how much that affected Twilio in general, but this part is related because Signal uses Twilio in order to do like phone phone identification, you know, verification stuff. So during that time, it may or may not have gotten access to the phone numbers of about 1,900 or so Signal users. And Twilio provides this like we talked about, but also Signal said in the warning that having access to those phone numbers, one, you know, that's kind of like identifying information for that individual, but also it means that they could have re-registered Signal uh, to their endpoints, essentially stealing that person's access on the platform, which is definitely not great. So Signal is telling everybody to, if they are affected that they need to re-register themselves. But at the same time, Signal has like already sent this warning out. So if you are affected, then you've already got that message. And if you're not affected, then you're fine. But it also brings up a topic about how Signal using phone numbers is not a great thing. Like I actually yeah. try to avoid using Signal as much as possible because I don't want to just give my phone number out to everyone. So the idea that Signal still exclusively uses phone numbers is in itself automatically creating a problem. Like for example, if they were people using Session, you know, we talked about Session before in a previous episode, you could say that it's superior in the sense that it doesn't use the phone number, it has just a session ID system. And if you get that session ID from someone, that's okay. And you could share it much more easily. You have to worry about your phone number being attacked. Like that is, just, it just seems really weird that Signal even has that still as a problem. Yeah, I think this is the biggest issue people have with Signal. Because I love Signal. I, I think, I love the idea behind it. I yeah. trust it for the most part with a lot of things they're doing. I trust it definitely yep. more than standard text messaging and things. What I like about this, if you're on an Android platform or things, is you can incorporate Signal as your main texting platform. So you don't have to open up two apps because essentially, even if the other person doesn't have Signal, you can incorporate your other SMS messaging into Signal and still have one app that you do all your messaging through. And it will give you the option with those individuals to send them a link to tell them to sign up for Signal if you want. Or if it's somebody who's not, because maybe it's just random contact that you're not going to have long-term contact with, you can still get their messages and you're not forgetting to use Signal. Because otherwise, if you have two text messaging applications, you might forget to send your secure stuff in Signal. So I like how it incorporates into the phone is trying to incorporate. I agree with you 100% cool. though. Session does a much better job staying away and avoiding the actual phone number piece of that. And Session is something that I definitely, a platform I want to see grow more. If you've not seen Session, go check it out. There's some bugs there. It's not perfect yet, but neither was Signal when it first came out. Um, still not perfect now, clearly. Uh, so there's some stuff that they need to work on, but Session is definitely the one I'm keeping my eye on for future use if I need to send something encrypted. Like if I'm sharing business information with Michael or other things or 
passwords that we're using as a company. I need a secure platform that's completely encrypted that I don't have to worry about someone being able to easily hack that. This Twilio issue is really interesting because a lot of companies use them for that phone verification. And that's a major leak. Clearly, this created a major problem. Now, Signal jumped on it. They fixed it. Good on them. But this is a problem Signal's going to have to think hard about of getting rid of that phone number problem. Or just like, I, I would hope that Signal would do something kind of like a combination of what Session does and what Signal can, is doing already. Like your point about the whole having it all in one application with the text messages and stuff, mm -hmm. that is a, definitely a, a perk that having the number attached is there for it. But I do think that they should have an extra layer where you can have also an ID that you can share that's separate from the phone number so you can have a combination of all of those things. And I think it's a shame that a lot of people are fans of Signal and because of its encryption protocol and stuff like that, but just don't use it because they don't want to give out their phone number. Like I, I yeah. have a signal on my phone, but I rarely use it because I don't want to give out my number. And I think that that's very common for a lot of people. So session is a lot easier in saying, yeah, here's an ID, an, an ID number that has nothing to do with me other than the fact that you can contact me. Like that's signal needs to just adopt something like that. Agreed. Mm hmm. But, you know, this goes deeper, Michael, because recently when we were looking at some technologies that we're using, we had some major problems occur. In fact, I was trying to, on the day that this latest issue happened, learn some more Python coding, interestingly enough. That was my plan for the whole day on that Saturday was to spend, like I got my kids and my wife to agree that this is the day I'm going to learn some new Python, some new things and code I'm working on. But instead, I got to spend 12 hours of my day working on this element matrix situation that had popped up. Yeah, and so we're going to be talking uh, about, like I mentioned yeah. earlier, that there was something that affected us. So we're going to talk about that for now. <laughs> so... Unfortunately, what happened is that Element Matrix decided to break, effectively. Um, what happened, We eventually we figured out what the actual cause was. But initially, for the first couple of days, we didn't know what was going on. And that first day, what Ryan was talking about, was very jarring that this happened. So let's break down the, the reason why we had a problem with Matrix slash Element. And that is, it removed us as admins from the room. <laughs> Pretty major, what? I'd say. <laughs> right? So it also removed all mods, well, seemingly all mods, from the room. And I was wondering, like, like Ryan sent me a message like, hey, you're the only one who can make changes because it removed, it, I, I don't have any powers. I was actually stuff. mad at you. I was yeah. mad because I'm like, you know, I'm like, Michael, seriously, you, you don't have <laughs> nobody else has mod powers but you because, you know. Yeah. But I think yeah. it's important to mention before this that we pay EMS oh, yeah. to host all of this and deal with all this. We, we give them money because we want to support this project for them to be able to pay and take care of these things. This is a managed service that we're giving them a lot of money because we have a lot of people on the network to be able to host this. So we expect things to just run. And what's the advantage to us? We get to be hands off until somebody who is selling illegal items pops into our chat and is trying to sell them to all of our people who are there, all 3,000 plus of you sitting in our element matrix room. And I find out we have no mod powers. So I'm here's now I've caught you up mm -hmm. to the point where I'm mad at Michael, like nobody has mod powers but you. There we go. Now you And then I respond there. with, <laughs> I don't have powers either, Ryan. Yeah, there we go. And it turns out this has been, a, this was happened for a little while. Like there was a period where this happened, I think like for two weeks and we didn't know about it because there weren't any, there weren't any signs of like, we need to address this. And us, people in the room were aware that this was a thing and we weren't uh, because they were asking like, why don't you upgrade the room? It's probably because of that bug. I'm like what bug? What are you talking about? Turns out that the room version we have at the time was, had a problem where it would revert just changes that you make in your room. So we originally created this room on the matrix.org server, and then we migrated it to the EMS thing because we started paying for it because we wanted to have it on our own domains and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, all of those changes that I had, I had made from that new domain was all gone. So it was all right back to where I made it originally, including the name, the, the avatar of the room and everything. So all the settings 
were all post pushed back. So while I lost control, I realized that my old account at matrix.org still had control. So I could get it back. So I did, and I did remod everybody and all that stuff. But the idea that this is even a, a problem was kind of baffling to me. Because well, the clue of, was because yeah. sometimes on one device, it would say Destination Linux, yes. which was the original. On other devices I would join, it would say Tux Digital. So depending on what device I was on, the same room was named something completely different, and I had different access and powers, except... When I would go to the destination Linux room because it reverted, although we didn't know this at this point, every option from banning to adding to removing people to doing anything would would allow me. The option was there and it would say failed, failed to do this, failed to do that. But the bigger picture is before this, there was a situation where our community was reaching out to us saying, why are you guys not using the latest encryption technology and things that Element Matrix has? And we're like, what are you talking about? We pay for this to be the latest yeah. and greatest stuff. We They're maintaining pay it for us. We for thought. this managed service. And we find out that, in fact, they left us on this very, very old version. And when Michael sent an email to them, their statement was, We don't do this for you. You need to do it because of possible compatibility issues. I'm like, what? What What do you mean? You, you So you're saying that when you upgrade the server... There's also a thing that we have to upgrade, but you're not going to tell me about that, like, at all? And then I have to find out in the worst possible way that I need to do this? <laughs> um, so, the, the first of all, the idea that there's even room versions separate from the server versions makes no sense to me. I don't get it. I, I, I've had people try to explain it. It's because of the Federation. Like, no, still, there's a, I've never seen that before. I've seen other things that are federated. This has never been a thing. This is the first time I've ever heard of a separation. Of their the implementation version. of federation. Yeah, it's just, it's weird. So that's always going to be weird. But the fact that we're paying for main, managed services and that they're not managing that part, this is also weird. But then later I find out that once I did research and digging all over this the API documentation, which is fun, um, it archives your room like like basically just locks it down, makes a whole new room, and theoretically automatically migrates the users. Now, there's also a warning that there's a potential for people not being migrated properly, which is like all of these things, like this shouldn't even be a problem. You shouldn't yeah. have to migrate them. You just, this room shouldn't have to have a separate version. The The server should be doing all of this. Like, why is this even a thing? It was very uh, concerning. So. Very concerning to the point where after losing multiple weekends and the fact that it's a complete threat to the business and our users, because who knows if you guys are on the latest secure version that doesn't have bugs or not, which is one of the primary things, by the way, in an open source community that we talk about. Make sure you're upgrading your stuff. You're on the latest versions. You're patching for all of the fixes and potential hacks and day zeros and things. And and we pay for this service to be done, to have that, and you don't get it, how am I going to do that to my community? So we have kind of, we're not leaving Matrix Element, but I'm certainly not going to give them money anymore. And what I want to do is go back to matrix.org and then let that sit and see if they will ever fix this and make it professional, like uh, actual business could use. Because mind you, we're dealing with thousands of people. As an individual user, none of this matters to you. Matrix and Element's yeah. great for an individual user. When you're trying to run a community with thousands of people and be able to communicate with them and run a business off it, um, it, that's where, in my opinion, it becomes a joke. It's not even like a funny joke or like, oh, it's just bugs. It's This is unusable from a business standpoint, a real business standpoint. Um, so for me, I would rather use something that I can actually get work done on and trust that it is what it says it is and it's on the latest version and if there's holes that it gets patched and, and those type of things. So um, we have a couple options for you. We have an IRC room, so go check that out uh, and join. And we also have Discord, which you can check out. Um, but there are other options we're looking into, like Revolt and things, and seeing if we could put our money in helping support open source projects, like an open source version of Discord, which would be amazing, and start funding those to see if they can make something that's uh, a little less comical when it comes to managing a community. So that's our fun element matrix story for all of you.
wasn't yeah. much mm-hmm. fun for me though. No, it wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't much fun. It, yeah, it, it was interesting to learn about the the nuances of of, of Federation building and that. No, it wasn't fun at all. Anyway, no. so, <laughs> so uh, if you do want to join us in the Tux Digital community, you can go to tuxdigital dot com slash community and you can get links to everything and all of that. So you can just, you don't have to you know find the, the the URL for the individual specific servers or whatever. You just go to tuxdigital dot com slash community and you get access to everything that you want to join, including a Steam group that we have for people who are, are gamers like us, because mm-hmm. we're all fantastic gamers, pro level, in fact. So you can join us in the Steam group for Tux Digital by going to tuxdigital.com slash community. So this week in our software spotlight, we're going to be talking about Element Matrix. I'm kidding. It's dead to me. We're going to talk about Hydra Paper. <laughs> Last week, I went on a little bit of a rant regarding GNOME's lack of functionality when it comes to scaling wallpaper. Uh, For this, I do not apologize at all. Another thing you can do with GNOME is choose a, or you can't do with GNOME, is choose a different wallpaper for your various monitors that you have. Uh, This is not as (laughs) big of a deal because I know a lot of desktop environments have this kind of problem, but because we were on this kind of whole GNOME discussion, there is a really cool tool that was created by Gabmus, who's a part of our community. We've actually had him on the show, done some collabs and things with Gabmus in the past, but it's called Hydra Paper. Hydra Paper is an amazing application that allows you to have, if you're using GNOME Desktop, a different wallpaper for every monitor. It's very easy to set up. It was brilliantly written. Uh, amazing job by him. And now that allowed me to have two Star Trek wallpapers and a Batman wallpaper on my three monitors. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, what does Star Trek have to do with Batman? Uh, you're right. I just happen <laughs> to like both those things. So whatever, Hydra paper, check it it's out. Like, it's just, it's just it's what oh. I do. get over it. Just deal with it. Yeah. yeah. yeah just deal with it. <laughs> and, and in fact, I actually booted in the desktop right now that I'm uh, for the show that I'm use, hi, using Hydra Paper in, is, and that is Ubuntu Mate because it works well with uh, classic GNOME as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Hydra Paper is very nice. Uh, I personally do not use it because I use KDE and it's built in by default, but uh, yeah. it's, it's really nice. Uh, yeah, for throw that, that in there, didn't you, you muffin <laughs> lover? I did. I did. <laughs> well, when I use Window Maker, it's built in also. <laughs> oh, so both of you are little <laughs> vengeful muffin lovers. <laughs> Muffins are fantastic. That's true. So it's just it's just a few lines of code. <laughs> yeah, no team. Few lines of code. <laughs> so Anyways. let's let's move on to the tip of the week because it is also something that I think is really fun. Because if you are familiar with the Grub system, if you're not, I'll just tell you real quick. It's basically the bootloader system, but it actually has a lot of really cool functionality but not the best looking appearance. And there are themes that for the Grub system if you want to customize your Grub. And we're going to have some links in the show notes for how to do that because there's both a like kind of a multiple directories of how to find the themes, but there's also something called the Grub Customizer, which is a GUI tool that makes it easy, very easy to customize your Grub. Because in certain distributions, there are that the location of where you put these themes is going to be different. And Grub Customizer just kind of takes care of all of that. You don't have to worry about it. So we'll have a link for that Grub Customizer to make it easier to have a really nice, fancy-looking Grub layout. When you ha- If you have multiple distributions, for example, that's very important because you have to choose which one you want. And you want to make it look like a, a Batman scene or a Star Trek scene. All out. All of that. You can do that. I love this idea of customizing Grub so I made the Fallout, the uh, Pet Boy, is that what it's called? Pit Boy? Uh, oh, nice. They, yeah, that nice. whole setup now. So when I go to pick what OS I want to boot into, it comes up with that. This is what I love about Linux. You could customize everything. And yes, I know KDE makes that. So you customize everything easy, whatever. But Grub, I don't need that. I can use this here. And a lot of the scripts, if you actually go into the customization options, I just want to mention that follow the instructions for that particular theme you're installing. Because some of them, you don't need to use Grub Customizer. You can just .sh install a file after you basically extract the zip and things, uh, and it will automatically find the right place and stuff. If you can't, and there's a specific one you want, then check out Grub Customizer. But keep in mind, you could do a lot of damage to your system with Grub Customizer. So stay in that theme section if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, Like if you're trying to rearrange Mm. what shows up first and last and things. Very good point. There could be some damage there. So just be careful with Grub Customizer. Very cool tool. Amazing. So glad we have it, but 
can cause some issues if you keep don't. in mind that you are messing with your bootloader of your system. And yeah. if you're not comfortable with doing that, then you can just skip this this week and go back to last week's tip of the week. <laughs> or do the .sh install one. The follow-up or do one that. was like yeah. a .sh, and it found where it needed to put the theme, and it was done. Yeah. And we're going to have a couple sources for links to find various themes to check out. Wh- whether you use the regular install or use Grub Customizer, we'll have links in the show notes for all this. So we have to say a happy birthday to Linux. Now, as soon as I put this in the show notes... Michael, being the I'm actually type of person that he is, I'm was not like, at all. Well, which <laughs> birthday? Because apparently there are multiple Linux birthdays. I'm but the not one that type whatsoever. You are. I was just you, making a joke that there are multiple birthdays, and it's, there's a big debate about how which, which one <laughs> yeah. is the right one and whatever. Who do you and think gets to settle that debate? We do. We <laughs> well, us us specifically. We decide okay, what birthday is, and the birthday is August 25th. 1991, which is Jill, why I have merch that says 91 on it like that, Absolutely. like a sports team Linux yes. 91 right there. Well, all the, birthdays are still <laughs> 90, all the birthdays are still 91. Yeah, so there's they're a all September still 91 as well. So it still, it still counts. It was, <laughs> yes. I should have uh, all of them are, but like the, most of them are. Well, August 25th, 1991 is when 21 year old Finnish student uh, Linus Benedict Torvalds made his now famous announcement on the comp.os so Minix news put group. The middle name in there. I didn't know that actually. Yes. Oh, Benedict. you didn't but now know. I know. Now cool. I know. <laughs> that's that's your same middle name, isn't it, Michael? Benedict? No, my middle name is Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. <laughs> <laughs> so I think when we look at Linux growth, even from the developer community, going from the 20s to the 40% and things, when I read this short letter. That was the announcement that we're celebrating of the birthday. Think about where Linux has come from this moment, from August 25th, 1991, when he wrote there using Minix. He said, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be a big and professional like GNU, for 386, 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. I'd like any feedback on things people like or dislike in Minix. As my OS resembles it somewhat, some physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons, among other things. I've currently ported Bash 1.08 and GCC 1.40, and things seem to work. This implies that I'll get something practical within a few months. I'd like to know what features most people would want. Any suggestions are welcome, but I won't promise I'll implement them. Then PS, yes, it's free of any Minix code, and it has multi-threaded FS, it's not portable, uses 386 tax, task switching, etc., and it probably never will support anything other than AT hard disk, as that's all I have. <laughs> Think about that. Like his yeah. expectations for what this was going to be versus what it became. Insane. It's crazy. And also, this uh, email is like kind of a, is a classic thing. And I... It's fun to you know look back on this every time we look at the, the the anniversary of Linux and how far it's going and the idea that you know we'll never be supported on anything else probably never anyway and this and now it's unsupported on everything like yeah. ev- everything and that's what's you know just it's it's mind blowing about how far we've come as the the Linux ecosystem from the period of just an email all the way to the space station. Like, it's just, it's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yep. it's amazing. And look at, you know, Linus even had the foresight to make it a multi-threaded file system. And, yes. and that has, that's one of the reasons why it became dominant. <laughs> yeah. He he was just playing with something and it became so yeah. big. Um, and of course, Der Hans hooks us up every week with events you should be looking forward to. So besides making sure you take some time to say happy birthday to Linux, check yes. out the Hacken Open Air. So this is in person on August 30th in Gifhorn, Germany. Enjoy several days of camping and coding. So there's your coding boot camp. If you are in Germany that you might want to go check out, as we talked about, you could become one of those developers, take in that Stack mm-hmm. Overflow survey in the future. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. We're here every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern live at tuxdigital.com slash live. And the best part, everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week. We can't wait to see you in the chat. We also have with us right now in the 60,000 square foot virtual stadium, 
our <laughs> patrons. And they're going to be joining us in the patron-only post show right after the show. And if you want to join us, you can you can join us when you go live to tuxedo.com slash live on Sundays. You can become a patron and then join us right after that by going to tuxedo.com slash contribute and clicking on the patron button. And, you know, you also get a ton of extra bonus features as well. Like we got p- tons of perks. We got the unedited versions of the show in addition to the patron-only post show. So if you missed the live stream, but you still want to see what nonsense we got up to that's had to be edited out for Pretty time, accurate. specifically for time. That's yeah. the only reason we ever edit anything out is just time. And uh, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And also go to tuxdigital.com slash store to get all the awesome merch that you merch. can get. Uh, we have uh, mugs, hoodies, t-shirts, uh, stickers, like all sorts of great stuff, including whatever nonsense <laughs> Ryan picks up every week for uh, no reason at all. And <laughs> but you can also get the, the the pseudo show shirt. I'm sporting that right now. And Jill's got the Linux 91 shirt. You can check that out all out at tuxdigital.com slash store. And make sure to check out our amazing shows here on Tux Digital. We have This Week in Linux, the pseudo show, the DOS Geek channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and Linux Saloon. And everyone head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all our wonderful shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week. And remember that the journey itself the journey is itself. just as important it's just as, as, important as the, destination. the destination. The destination. Oh, the destination. I'm sorry. The I said destination. it before you, Ryan. It's fine. I, yours is better. You could just cut mine and then it's cute because it features Jill's voice, Jill's cute, adorable voice coming in right there. Destination.